All right, today we're going to talk about fluids, and specifically pressure in Pascal's principle. And through this unit, we're going to discover why the Titanic sank. So Titanic sank basically because they see this much above the water. They're like, oh, it's pretty small. But you actually have all this crap down here below it. And that spells bad news for ships. But we're going to learn why eventually, not all in this podcast, but why only this chunk is above the ocean and all this stuff is below. But in this podcast, we're going to define fluid. We're going to learn and use formula for pressure. We're going to discuss Pascal's principle, and we're going to derive an equation for Pascal's principle. So you know there are three common forms of matter, and these matter, these forms exist at an ordinary temperature. There's also a fourth kind of plasma, but that only exists at really high temperatures. But we're only worried about uh, th the three main ones. Solids has a shape and forms a surface. So it keeps its shape and it has a fixed volume. Liquid has no shape but forms a surface. So liquids take the shape of the container. And the surface can change depending on the container. And it also has a fixed volume. And you're not going to get more liquid than you have already. And there's also gases. The last one has no shape no surface, takes the shape of the container, and if that volume of that container changes, so does the volume of that gas. If you change the volume of this container, the liquid's still going to have the same volume. If you change the volume of this container, that solid just sits there. Now, the, li the liquid's going to change shape, but it's going to still have the same volume of the liquid. But that gas, it's going to take the amount of volume that the container has. So what do we mean when we talk about fluids? Fluids are any of those substances that flow and they take the shape of the container. So fluids are liquids and gases. Now most of you probably think that fluids are just the liquids. That's most you know colloquial form of the word fluid. But fluids are actually the gases too. It's any substance that takes the shape of the container. Uh, fluids have atoms and molecules that are free to move. There's no long-range correlation between the positions of these molecules. They can just flow wherever they want. Just because it's in one place this second doesn't mean it's going to be the same place ever again. You ever heard the saying, like, you can never step in the same river twice? That's why. Like, there's, it flows. Molecules go everywhere. So fluids, there's an intrinsic property of a fluid, and this is its density. We've all learned about density in your past physics, past chemistry, past general science courses. And the formula for density is rho equals m over v. It's not a p. Do not get that confused with pressure. This is a rho, and it stands for density. And that equals mass divided by volume. You get units in the SI units, SI system of kilograms per meters cubed or you can translate those into 10 to the negative 3 grams per centimeter cube. So one kilogram per meter cubed equals this small guy right here. Here's some common densities. Density of water is about one gram per centimeter cube. Ice, slightly less. That's why ice floats. We're gonna learn that less dense things float on top of more dense things. Air, really not dense at all. Mercury, very, very dense. If you poured some mercury into a glass of water, it's just going to sink right to the bottom. And here we got tungsten or gold, have about the same density. So if you ever want to trick somebody, you can make them a tungsten necklace and spray paint it gold, and it's going to have like the same density. Not that I suggest ripping people off. Uh, another intrinsic parameter is uh, the pressure. Also a very easy equation. It's pressure equals the force divided by the area. And this force is always perpendicular to this area. It's normal to the area, just like normal force from our past units was normal to whatever surface the object was on. This force right here is normal to the area. So any force exerted by fluid is perpendicular to the surface, I already said that, and proportional to the area. Because uh, force is a vector, 
but pressure is a scalar, so we have to have a way to relate those. So if we solve that equation for force, we get the force vector is equal to pressure times area, and since it's perpendicular and force is a vector, we have to have this little n, it should be n caret, which just is a normal vector, and it looks something like that. So that little vector is just perpendicular to any surface area that we're talking about. Uh, SI unit of pressure, A, B, C, D, or E, if you said A, you would be correct. And that is called a Pascal, abbreviated PA. Uh, just like a Newton stands for a kilogram times meter squared, or a kil kilogram times meter over second squared, one Pascal is one Newton per meter squared. So we can actually do that. So a Newton is a kilogram times a meter over second squared. We're dividing it by meters squared. So therefore, a Pascal is a kilogram over second squared meters. So that's a Pascal. I might see pressure in bars or millibars or tors also. Here's the conversions for that. Uh, there's a couple other conversions. Uh, it's very common, especially in chemistry class. I think it's the last time I used ATMs. So one atmosphere equals a lot of pascals, not so many bars, and even fewer tors. Then we also have this, our very English one, our PSI, our pounds per square inch. You'll see these on your tires when you're inflating them, like do not exceed this PSI. So there's our equation again. Uh, we already know that. So here's a quick example. Waterbed mattress is about 2 meters by 1.5 meters by 0.3 meters uh, when filled with water. So it's filled with water, so its density is going to be 1 gram per centimeter, centimeter cubed, which is, I'll show you the conversion here in a second. So what pressure does it exert on the floor? I don't give you a lot of information. I just tell you that it's filled with water and I give you its dimensions. So I'm going to derive an equation for you. So we're going to start with our density equation. We're going to solve this guy for mass. So mass equals rho v. All right. And we're going to use Newton's second law, because this thing never escapes us. And we want to know the weight of that mattress. So isn't weight just a force? So weight equals mass. And what acceleration do we use to find weight? If you said gravity, that means you paid attention. So now we have m equals rho v, and we have weight equals mass times gravity. We can just substitute this m into here. So our weight is going to equal... Uh, our density times our volume times gravity. Now, I gave you the density because I said it's filled with water. I give you all the dimensions so we know its volume and we all know what gravity is. So there's an important equation right there. But there's more. We want to know the pressure it exerts on the floor. So pressure equals the force divided by area. And what force are we talking about? We're talking about weight. So it's weight divided by area. We said weight was equal to all that. So rho Vg over A. All right, here's where you got to recall some geometry. It's the formula for volume of a rectangle. It's length, width, height, times gravity, all over length times width. LW, LW, gone. So we get another formula, pressure, equals rho h g. So two equations derived, both uh, stuff we're looking for. We're looking for the weight of that mattress and we're looking for the pressure it exerts on the floor. All right, so we're gonna use that first equation, rho g v. So here is our density in kilograms times kilograms per meters cubed times our gravity times our length times our width times our height of that mattress you multiply all those together you get a weight of 
8,820 newtons, which is about a ton. Pretty heavy mattress. Now, we already derived the formula for that pressure. So we're just left with rho GH, our density again, in kilograms per meters cubed, times our G, times the height of that mattress. And you get 2,940 pascals, which is about 0 0.029 ATMs. We'll talk about more about ATMs later. Or about 0.43 PSI. Now this is if the mattress is laying flat on your floor. Like I'm sure whenever you go to college, at one point in your life, you're going to have a mattress on the floor. But if we put it on a frame, you know, you get to graduate college, get a job, you can actually afford a bed frame. How does that change this? It's going to make the pressure a lot more. The pressure will be enormous. Why is that pressure enormous? Because before, all this area was resting on the ground. Now we only have the area of the little legs in contact with the ground. A lot smaller area. So this area is smaller right here. It's going to make this pressure a lot bigger. So the less area, the more pressure. So, interesting equation. Pressure equals rho GH. Pressure exerted by fluid depends only on the height of the fluid. Uh, is this true in general? Pretty much. Here's some important facts about fluids. A fluid exerts pressure in all directions. The force due to the pressure of a fluid at rest is always perpendicular to any surface in contact with. If it wasn't, the fluid would just flow until it eventually came to rest somewhere else. So back to that question, is it true? Uh, yeah, pretty much, yes. Yes, it is true. Uh, most textbooks, I believe yours included, derive an equation. Instead of big H, they have little h. They might use big H in your book, I don't remember. For the pressure in a fluid, a depth below the surface. So if I have a glass of water, we put an object in here. We want to know what the pressure is right there. We just find that H. And another equation, important, the delta, change in pressure, going down. So start it here, go down to here, that'll be a delta H. Yeah. Delta H, from here to here. Uh, better ways of writing these, though. The pressure below the surface minus the pressure above equals that rho GH or h is the magnitude of the distance between below and above. So we're just looking for that, that h will be just that guy right there between below and above. And the other guy, we're not going to use h. We're going to use uh, y's instead. And that's saying that y goes up. So that's why we have that negative there. So if we go down below the surface, this delta y is going to be negative. It's going to get rid of that negative sign. It's going to give us that change of pressure. All right, so those previous equations are true if the fluid is uniform. Density does not change with depth. So we don't have two different fluids sitting there resting. It doesn't get denser. But, you know, logically it makes sense that density would get bigger as, the, as you got deeper. That'd be because you have a lot more fluid on top of you squishing down the fluid that you're in. You would assume that would make it more dense. The fluids are relatively inc uh, incompressible. Like water is very incompressible. So the variation is actually really small. Like there is some variation. It does get a little denser the deeper you go. But it really doesn't matter too much to affect our problems. Unless you're building submarines and like going to the bottom of, you know, the ocean. Uh, so it doesn't... This variation of pressure doesn't depend on the shape of the container, only the depth. And that's because I can have a very small cylinder of water and put something down, say, two centimeters. Or I can spread all that water out in a big, like, square container. Same volume of water, just in a bigger container. Still, I'm going to put that object down two centimeters. It's still going to have the same pressure. That's because there's still the same amount of volume above that object. So the volume right here above this object, all this guy, 
is still the same as the volume above all this guy. If you don't believe me, use some geometry and you can see it. And let's get rid of that. It's clear. So just something to think about. When you go home, you turn on the faucet, the water comes out. Why does that happen? Think about it and tell me. All right, and now we're going to get into Pascal's principle. Uh, for a uniform fluid in an open container, pressure at pressure is the same. Sorry, it's very bad English there. Uh, for a uniform fluid, and, God, my English was terrible. I can't even think of what I was meant to say there. For a uniform fluid in an open container, pressure is the same at a given depth, and it is independent of the container. So that's why we just said it doesn't matter. I can go down right here. It's going to be the same pressure as right here. The same pressure is right here. The same pressure is right here. And the same pressure is like right here. Now that's because the volume of water on top really doesn't matter. It only depends on how far down you go. All right. Now, if we can connect all of these containers, the fluid level will be the same height. It doesn't matter what these surfaces or what shape all these tubes have. Whenever I fill this up with water, all these guys are going to have the same height. I'm never going to be bigger here, smaller here, bigger here. doesn't matter. It's all going to even out to be the same height. And that's how barometers work. Invented by this dude. He looks kind of, you know, he's got a pretty cool goatee. And a uh, barometer is a long closed tube filled with mercury and inverted in a dish of mercury. And the closed end is nearly a vacuum. So up here, nearly a vacuum, pressure equals zero. No fluid in there, no air, to be no pressure. So we got mercury and mercury. So it measures atmospheric pressure as, and that's where we get in the atmospheres. Usually measuring uh, ATMs or meters of mercury. You also see millimeters of mercury. It's probably more common MMHGs. So that's basically just how much the millimeters, how high that mercury goes up this tube. That's where the MMHG comes from. And that comes from the pressure. So your fluids press down on this gas, which pushes up the mercury in the tube. And you can see with the change, you know, I have little like marks on here showing different millimeter marks, and that'll give you your pressure. All right, so what if we have two fluids in there, different densities? So here's a U-shaped tube. Uh, one density here, another density here. So how do the densities of these liquids compare just by looking at this drawing? Is P1 less dense than P2? Are they equal? Or is P1 greater than P2? All right, so the red arrow, since we know that it doesn't matter, shape of the container, got to have the same pressure. So on either side, pressure must be the same. So here we're saying that P1 times Y equals P2 times D1 plus Y. So our pressure times our depth on both sides. So now that helps us to determine that this guy is the correct answer because we factor this out and we're left with this extra little d1 on this side so that means this guy has to be smaller to make up for this extra distance so we get p1 or sorry uh, density of the first one is greater than the density of the second so why is this useful i can think of one great reason that i use all the time and that is beer now i can't condone the consumption of alcohol to minors but i just want to share my own personal experience using this pressure now whenever i brew beer i put this thing on it called an airlock and this airlock seals out so there's like a rubber stopper here with a hole in it and my beer is brewing down here under, below it. As that beer is brewing, it produces, all the yeast produces carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide travels up through this airlock 
and pushes the water on this side upwards. So here is the equilibrium point. You can kind of see it on this guy. And here, this is all air. And here's where the water starts. And you can see the water level in this guy pretty high on this side. Now as my beer ferments, the water is going to slowly start coming back up here. This one's going to start going down until eventually it reaches the equilibrium point. And that's when I know my beer is ready. And that makes Mr. G happy. All right, so Pascal's principle, we have discovered using Newton's laws that pressure depends on the depth of the liquid. And Pascal's principle addresses how a change in pressure is transmitted through a fluid. So we change pressure in one spot of the fluid, how's it gonna affect the rest of it? And what Pascal's principle says is, any change in the pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted to every portion of the fluid and to the walls of the containing vessel. So we basically, you change pressure someplace else, it's gonna change it everywhere else because it's gonna be transmitted through that fluid to every other portion of the fluid, every portion. So pictures make things easier. Here, I'm going to show you why we use Pascal's principle. Even though you don't know what it is, you've probably used it before. Maybe you know, never figured it out, but it's definitely useful like in your vehicles and stuff. So here we have two different cylinders. Smaller cylinder, larger cylinder with pistons in them. So we're going to push down with a force on this cylinder. And it's in turn going to create a pressure difference in this fluid. So the pressure over here is going to increase, so pressure everywhere else is going to increase. It's eventually going to make this force 2 go up. So the force is transmitted through the liquid and create an upward force, force 2. So we push down with one force, but we get a different force up. Why is it different? Because different areas. If this was the same area, F1 would equal F2. Since it's a larger area, we have to come up with a formula for determining that. It's actually a pretty easy formula. So Pascal's principle says that increased pressure from F1 is transmitted throughout the liquid, and F2 is going to be greater than F1 because of this formula. So we know the pressure is the same everywhere. So P1 equals P2. How do we find the pressure of the first one? It's the force divided by the area. Force divided by area. How do we find the pressure of the second one? Force 2 divided by area 2. Now since area 2 is much larger, that means F2 2 has to be bigger to compensate because we have to have both of these sides balanced. We can also rearrange these. The area area 2 divided by area 1 equals force 2 divided by force 1 depending on what you're solving for. And another common thing to see is the force 2 is going to be equal to A2 times F1 over A1. A thing you're going to see a lot. I'm just trying to find how much force that is. Now that area 2 is going to be bigger than this area, so it's going to make this force larger. So let's see, we push down with 5 kilograms. Well, it should be newtons. We have a load up here. So this is how hydraulics work. Push down with a little guy here, and it lifts up a load. So it makes sense to have smaller tubes on this side and larger on this side because we apply a smaller force because of a smaller area to get the force, a larger force with a larger area. So we can lift it up higher. So the force applied to an area on the left is applied to the same to keep the same pressure on both sides. So we know P1 over here is going to equal P2. So whatever force we apply here, it's going to affect our stuff over here. And that's how hydraulics work. So we make this area over on this side bigger, so that means we get a bigger force to compensate for the bigger area to make sure P1 still equals P2. So that means we can apply less force here to lift a heavier object. Because pressure stays the same on both sides, but the forces get multiplied on the right because the area is twice as great as the left. So smaller force to lift a bigger thing if you have a bigger area on this side. So that's why we use hydraulics. So just a little bit more, almost done. So 
Another way to state Pascal's principle is the pressure is applied to a confined fluid increases the pressure throughout the system by the same amount. I'm just reiterating the same stuff I've already said. Push down with a force F1 here on an area one. It's going to affect this P2 over here. But we know P1's got equal P2. So this force 2 is going to be larger than this F1, hence the thicker arrow, because we have to make up for this A2. And you'll see in problems like why this happens. And here's that other equation I showed you, F2 equals all that stuff. Another way to write it, I wrote A2 times F1 over A1. We could also write it A2 over A1. It's the same thing, just using a little bit of algebra. Uh, and I have the same slide up there again. Yeah, it happens. So what technology uses this? And I swear this is the last slide. Uh, hydraulic pumps, like any of these guys, you notice like the cylinders on the hydraulics on these are very small, but they can lift enormous loads. And that's because the smaller area, you need less force to lift a larger load because it's a bigger area. Also use it in hydraulics in your car, and anytime you take it to the shop to get an oil change or get your tires rotated, those car lifts use it too. See, I told you it was the end. <laughs>